Okay, so we're going to do a, a quick recap on uh, truss and roof loading, uh, which we've already covered in first and second year in fundamentals of engineering and in uh, strengths of strengths of materials. Okay, so what's a truss? Um, so what are the characteristics of a truss? So a truss consists of straight members, so a number of different straight members, like AC, CB, AD, and DB. So they're a uh, number of straight members, and they're joined together uh, at endpoints. So we can see them joined together at, at endpoints here. So they're joined here at C, a joint at B, a joint at D, and a joint at A. So those joints, so the members are joined together by um, a bolt, um, so bolt connections or welded connections in there. What we also assume is that that um, connection, so the connection between B, uh, say between the member CB and DB, that that's a pin connection. In other words, that the, the two members can freely rotate relative uh, to each other. Okay. Oh no. Not good. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, so we've two members together that are, that are connected together uh, in a truss. Now what we're saying is a pin connection. In other words, that there's uh, one member relative to the other is free to free to rotate. So there's no resistance to rotation at the end of the member. Okay, so they're free to rotate relative to each other. So in other words, there's no moments um, induced at the end of the member. Okay. Um, then we apply force, an external force to trust through a node. Okay, so typically it's through a node, not through a member, but through a node is where the force is applied. And then when that external force is applied, that will generate internal forces within each of the different uh, members. So, for example, there's a, a load applied here, P, into this truss, and then that will put a force into uh, CD. So what we're doing is we're pulling down on D. That's going to put uh, CD into tension. In other words, we're pulling down on CD. We're trying to stretch uh, C CD, remember CD, so it's in tension. Um, also, uh, member AD and member DB will also be in tension as well, because they will also be trying to be uh, stretched as well. Whereas member a AC and CB are going to be in compression, because they're try we're trying to shorten them or compress them, so they're going to be in compression. So we, we've already learned how to design a member in tension, so we should be able to design member CD uh, once we know what the force is uh, in it. We also learned how to design members in compression, so once we know what the compressive uh, force in AC is, we should be able to design that member. Okay, so thus uh, a truss is classified as a structure um, composed of straight members joined together with pin connections such that members are free to rotate. Okay, so a pin connection. And in the diagram here, we've indicated a pin connection uh, with an open circle. So in other words, that each of those members are free to rotate relative uh, to, to each other. Force which are applied to the truss, uh, like in this example on the right hand side here, they're applied to the truss at the joints, um, and they result in internal uh, forces. So if we apply a force at the joint uh, over here um, on this truss, and that is going to end up creating some internal forces within the member. So if I pull down on, on, on the, the node here at the very end, then what's going to happen? But if I'm pulling down here, then, oops. If I, pull, if I pull down on that node uh, there, then there's something internally has to resist that. So if I'm pulling down, then I have to have a, an equal and opposite reaction going up the way, because I have to have equilibrium at the node. Okay, so that is the member, uh, and I've drawn the arrow going up the way at some sort of angle going up the way. I haven't drawn it that well. Um, and effectively what happens is that the vertical component, and then there's a horizontal component of that. Okay, so it's a vector. The vector uh, has got a direction and a magnitude. Okay. So that vector here, PV, it's a direction and a magnitude. 
will be the same as this uh, one on, 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 on the uh, that's applied. So the external applied load PV is going to be equal, it has to be an equal and opposite reaction in the vertical direction. And because this is an inclined member, because it's an inclined member, uh, then I can use a vector to head uh, on that member, or I can have that vector as being a combination of a vertical and a horizontal component. So the vertical component here is equal and opposite to the vertical um, externally applied load. Then the horizontal component here is going to have something to, uh, to balance it out as well. Okay, so at the moment, uh, we have nothing to balance it out. There's no external load here. But therefore, um, this uh, PV here, PH, this horizontal load is going to have to be balanced out. And so it's going from uh, right to left. So we have to balance that out with the equal and opposite load on the bottom of PH. Okay. So now this, uh, this joint here is in equilibrium because if we look at the sum of the vertical reactions, we've got the external applied force PV. Is equal, we have an equal and opposite internal uh, force here, PV. And that's the vertical component of this uh, um, uh, vector here that's along the, the direction of the member. Then the horizontal component of that vector pH has to be balanced out with something else. So that is going to be balanced out by uh, the force within the um, within the bottom chord here, pH. Right, so then we have an equal and opposite. So the sum of the horizontal forces are equal. pH is going from right to left um, uh, here due to this member. And then pH is going from left to right due to the member down, down below here. And then are the members in tension or compression? So if we look at this member here, pH uh, in there, so we're catching the node at the end of it. We're trying to pull the node down, so we're trying to stretch the member. The member doesn't want to be stretched, so there's a so there's a resistance that's stretching, uh, and that's why the arrow is going in the way. So that that member is in tension because the arrows are pointing in the way. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so this member here is in tension. Well, as you can see, the, the, the bottom member, um, the arrow is going uh, towards the node. That means that something is pushing on the node, uh, trying to shorten the member, trying to compress the member, and the member doesn't really want to shorten. Uh, so it's an internal resistance to being shortened, so therefore it's in compression. So the arrow is going uh, out towards the node. Okay. And then we need to, uh, if we have a, an arrow in one direction on one side of the member, then we need to do the same on the other side of the member. Okay. So internally, it has to be balanced out. So we have a pH on this side, balance out with the pH on the other side. And the same with the other um, uh, diagonal member here. We have to have an equal and opposite uh, force the other side of the member. Okay. And then we go through all each of the different nodes. So that's what we do in a if we're doing the method of, of joints, where we go to every joint, we balance it out where the sum of the horizontal reactions are equal to zero, the sum of the vertical reactions are equal to zero. Uh, then we have an the equal and opposite force on the other side of the member. That's one uh, force we already know. Then we have to resolve out the other forces at that node. Same at the bottom here. We have one force here, we have to resolve the other forces out. Okay, so forces which are applied to the truss at the joints result in internal axial forces in the members. No bending moments. So that's just what we've worked out. This external force here has made an internal force in this member, which is a tension force, and has also made an internal force in this member here, which is a compression force in there. We can go through the whole lot of the truss and, and uh, resolve that out. So I'll, I'll do one example uh, later on on this. Lots of different types of trusses that we can use. Pratt trusses. So there's a Pratt truss that looks like uh, this one. There's also a Pratt truss that looks like this one. A Hoey truss. Again, you can have a pitched groove in a Hoey truss, or we can have a flat uh, version of a Hoey truss. A Fink truss, Warren truss, Baltimore trusses, K trusses. In the, um, the project, you're going to design a Fink truss and a Pratt truss in there. So you're going to design Fink trusses. So there's a Fink truss that's going to then sit on top of a Pratt truss. So we're going to design both of those type of trusses as part of the project. 
lots of famous uh, uh, bridges around the world use trusses. So we can see uh, the Tokyo Gate Bridge here. We can clearly see some trusses here uh, in here. OK. And uh, all the way up through here. So there's trusses there, but you can also see on the plan as well. We'll also have some bracing on the plan as well, uh, because to stop it from um, um, warping back and over, or stop it from bending in the other direction as well. Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, so you have the, the arch here is made up of uh, trusses all the way along. So you can see the trusses. You can see that the um, height of the trusses are smaller in the middle and larger at the end. And then from the that arch is made up of trusses, then there's cables hanging off it, and the deck then uh, hangs off those uh, those cables. Okay. You can see on the other end here, we can see a standard truss on the other end uh, of it carrying the road deck. So in this case, the road deck is sitting on top of the truss. In the other case here, the road deck is hanging off the bottom of the, the bottom of the truss there. Okay. We use trusses uh, for the electric uh, electricity pylons uh, in there, so you can see the different types of trusses. These trusses are cantilevering off the off the ground. They're carrying the cables um, all the way along in them. They have to deal with wind forces. They have to deal with the, the weight of the cables themselves and so on uh, in there. So they're larger at the bottom, larger base and thinner as you go to the top because it's effectively a cantilever uh, type thing. So there's bigger forces at the bottom and smaller forces uh, near the top. Then of course even at the little uh, outriggers here to carry the the, um, the cables, they're all little mini trusses as well that come out to carry the cables. Uh, cranes and ports, uh, you can see some trusses here uh, for the cranes, uh, gantry cranes here, more trusses as well going across uh, the top. So lots and lots of trusses. This was one of the most famous trusses in the world is the Eiffel Tower. Uh, it wasn't very well designed. Uh, it was only supposed to be a temporary structure uh, to last, I think, something like 10 years, and it's been there over 100 years now at this stage uh, in there so it's been it would suggest it was well over designed when it was designed that's made up with lots of different uh, trusses within it okay so let's do so let's uh, look at the truss analysis we can either do a 3d analysis or a 2d analysis uh, so space truss for 3d or a plane truss for 2d we're just going to focus on uh, 2d analysis because that's good enough for us in in this uh, project What's the assumptions? I mentioned these already. Uh, the members of the truss are, are connected at their ends by frictionless pins or hinges. In other words, when I get two members and I rotate them relative to each other, so there's, uh, if I try and rotate them relative to each other, there's no resistance to that rotation. So it's frictionless pin uh, because there's no resistance whatsoever to rotation. So it's a hinge. The truss is loaded and supported only at its joints. So where the two members are more, two or more members meet together, that's the joint, uh, and that the external load is only applied at the joints, not along the length of any of the members. And the forces in the members of the truss are purely axial, so they're normal forces. Uh, so imagine you get your ruler and you catch a ruler and you try and uh, pull it apart. You're putting an axial load because you're putting the force along the axis or along the direction of the member uh, in tension. Or if you squash the ruler, you're putting the load uh, again along the axis of the member, along the direction of the member uh, in compression. So we don't bend it. Uh, we don't. Uh, it's pure axial uh, force. That's what we're going to design for. Now, to make it easy, we're going to assume that our uh, the self weight of the truss is, is negligible, and we're going to apply loads just only at the joints. When we look at the reactions uh, of it. We have different types of reactions that we can uh, supports that we can have, uh, which are then going to cause reactions at the end of the end of the um, beam. So, if we have an external pin. In this uh, first example, the external pin means, in this case, you cannot uh, move left or right um, because it's it's uh, fixed in the translational direction, left or right. It cannot move up or down because it's fixed in the translational direction, up and down. It can freely rotate, so that member could freely rotate, so there'd be no problem, no problem in that uh, member rotating. It could rotate without any without any effort because that is a pin that goes through. It. So there's no resistance to rotation. But there is a resistance to stop it from moving from left to right and to stop it from moving up or down. So if we take the x direction along the length of the member, y direction orthogonal to that, then we will get two uh, reactions as a result of this uh, pin, or up to two reactions. One in the horizontal direction, fx, and the other in the vertical direction, fy. If we have an internal pin within a member, uh, there's going to be always two unknowns, one in the x direction uh, and one in the y direction. In there. We need to resolve out those forces at every uh, 
in. And effectively, the sum of the um, horizontal forces should equal to zero, and the sum of the vertical forces should equal to zero. If we have a roller connection, so in this example, the roller connection, it cannot move up or down. Okay, so it's sitting on top of the roller. We're stopping the member at the end from moving up or down. It can freely rotate, and it also can freely move left or right. Either. So therefore, if it can freely move left or right, there's no resistance to stop it from moving left or right. Therefore, there is no reaction uh, going left or right. However, it's not free to move up or down, so it's been resisted from moving up or down. So therefore, there is a reaction uh, in there at that support to stop it from moving up or down. Okay, so a reaction force at that uh, node. The truss is supported the joints by two kinds of supports. Effectively, we're going to use either a pin support or a roller support. So a pin support is also known as a hinge uh, in it. So as I said, that hinge or that pin support will stop um, the end of the truss from moving, say left or right, in the X direction, and it'll also stop it from moving up or down or in the Y direction. Okay, so it prevents the point from moving in plane. Therefore, we end up getting uh, two reactions, one in the vertical direction, and one in the horizontal direction. The other main types of support that we can use is the roller support. So that prevents the point from moving normal to the uh, supporting surface um, in there. So it can't move up or down relative to the, the surface. So it can't move up or down. But it can freely move left or right. So therefore, you only have a vertical reaction or a reaction normal to the surface that's supporting it. At. So I had a look under the quintessential bridge there, uh, was a guest there the day before, uh, and that bridge just beside the engineering building here, you look underneath that, it's simply supported on top of a couple of bearings on either side. They're effectively free to move uh, left or right, but not up or down. Okay, so therefore all those pen, all those connections uh, in there, it allows it to freely move left or right, uh, but not up or down. So that would be the, um, this would be the, the representative type uh, support for those, uh, for, for, for those bridge bearings. So the truss must have a pin support and a roller support to be structurally determined. To determine it. Okay, so we have to have a pin support on one side and a, and a roller support to be structurally determined so that we can work out what all the forces are in the member by hand. Otherwise, we won't be able to. So if we had a pin support on one side of the truss and a pin support on the other side of the truss, then it's structurally indeterminate and we cannot do, use hand calculations to work out forces in the member. So we need to let one uh, end of the truss freely move left or right and we keep the other one in position. So if the structure is deterministic, we can find reaction forces and we can find the internal member forces using the equi equilibrium equations. Okay, so for a 2D truss with loads applied in the X, Y plane, we can use the sum of the horizontal forces equal to zero, some of the vertical forces are equal to zero, and the sum of the moments are equal to zero. The two ways of doing a truss problem, as you would have covered in CE 227, uh, you have the methods of section and you have the joint method. So the next met method of section would be that you would cut through the members of that truss. So you make a cut through the members of the truss, then you have an internal uh, force uh, in there. So if I have a truss, like say this, okay, that is supported on one side, and support on one side, roller support on the other side. It might have a vertical applied load. B here, and then, then I might want to cut through that uh, truss. So I'm going to cut through the members of the truss, try and work out the forces in it. So I might say, well, I'll cut that through here. I can cut up to three members. Yeah, so I cut through all those three. Um, and then what does that leave me uh, with? So then I've got a truss. So I had a okay. So you know, I would have a, a vertical reaction at at a, a, a vertical reaction at the support and a horizontal reaction at that support, and then I've got all these forces within the, within the members. Uh, so I would have oops, down operation. Run that the wrong way. No. 
sorry. Sorry. Up. Force it right. Okay, so I know that the internal member here is in compression. So therefore, the external one is going to be in the opposite direction. So then I have uh, a force here. And then um, this guy here is going to be in. Sorry, I did make a mistake. One sec, sorry. Try again. Okay, sorry again. Okay, so that member at the bottom is going to be a stretch, so it's going to be in tension. Uh, in there, so that that member's intention, so it's going that way. That means your action is going to be going the opposite way. Okay. Um, then the other members are going to be in compression, in squashed, in squashed. Okay. So I've taken the force there. There's a force uh, going equal, equal and opposite in that way. And this guy here is going to be in tension. Okay. So I've cut the truss uh, up. So the method of sections, so I've cut the truss in, uh, in three places. So I've cut the truss across up to three places. I've cut the truss there in three places. And therefore, I now have one, two, three external, uh, three loads there within the members, or three forces within the members. I've got the external reactions, and now I can work out the, from equilibrium then, I can work out what uh, all of these forces are. Or the other one is the joint method, uh, which is what we're going to do uh, within uh, this class. So I'll go through that in a bit more detail. The method sections, it's best method if, if only the interest in the force in a few members of the trust, because we're only in here, because we cut through these three, we can get the forces in these three members. But what about all the forces in the other members of the truss as well? It's a relatively straightforward truss because it's a small truss. Uh, but if we had a bigger truss with more members in it, we'd have a long time going through all the different members, cutting them and so on. So it's really best if you only want to know the, the force in a few of the members in the truss. What's the rules? Well, you cut through the members you want to find the internal forces in. Uh, you cut the truss completely in two parts. So that's what we've done here basically cut down to the truss here completely uh, and then that means that we uh, we have uh, a bit of truss here on the left hand side and then we have these forces associated with it we can cut a maximum of three members in it so if there's more than three members then it won't work um, for the structural design we generally need to know all the forces in the truss to design all the members so therefore uh, the focus of this course will be on the joint method what's the joint method was well, as i said is the best method that you, if you want to find the force in all the members in the truss it involves using the force equilibrium equations. In other words, the sum of the horizontal reactions are equal to zero, and the sum of the vertical reactions are equal to zero at each joint, solve for the forces in all the different members. There's a number of steps we go through. First, we have to determine if the structure is statically determinate, because if it's not statically determinate, uh, then we cannot uh, solve it by hand. Okay, so that's the very first check, and I'll show you how to do that, or remind you how to do that. We then draw a free body diagram of the entire truss, and solve for the support reactions. Uh, once we've done that, then we take a specific joint uh, and then we draw a free body diagram of the joint with one or two unknowns, uh, one unknown on the X or the Y direction. If we have more than one unknown uh, in either direction, then we can't solve the equation. So we need to only have one unknown in the equation and then we can solve it. Assume all unknown forces to be tension forces at first. Uh, then we use uh, the equilibrium. We say that the sum of the horizontal reactions are equal to zero. Sum of the vertical reactions are equal to zero. That helps us to solve for the unknowns. If the answer is negative, uh, then the member is in compression. Okay? Because we've already made an assumption that, the tension, that it's a tension member. Uh, and therefore, if the answer is positive, our assumption is correct. If our answer is uh, 
if it, if we get a negative answer, that means we have the arrow in the wrong direction. In other words, that the member is in compression. And we repeat the steps two to five for each joint uh, in there. So we do uh, work out the uh, some of the vertical rea some of the horizontal reactions and some of the vertical reactions at each joint uh, in there until we have the whole truss done. So careful select joint selection sequence is required to solve the structure. So if we use a bit of co uh, common sense uh, in there and try and pick the easier joints to solve first, uh, then that will help us uh, within within um, to be efficient within our design. So we have uh, so the first step, step one, as I said, is to um, work out whether the um, truss is statically determined or not. So what are we looking for? We want to work out what the support uh, reactions are um, for the load takedown uh, calculations. Okay, so we need to work out what the support reactions are. So we have a, a truss here on the bottom. If we look at, at joint D, we can see joint D can freely move on the bottom right hand side here. We can see joint D can freely move left to right. So there can be no reaction because it's free to move. So there's no resistance to stop it from moving. So therefore, there's no reaction. However, the vertical direction. It's not free to move up or down, uh, so therefore there's going to be a vertical reaction at, at D, okay? Because it cannot freely move up or down. If we look at A, uh, at A, well A also can't move uh, up or down, okay? So we have a vertical reaction at A. This is a pin support, so that's stopping it from uh, moving up or down. It also cannot move left or right, so we potentially have a, a horizontal reaction. At A as well. Yeah, so we potentially have a horizontal reaction at A as well because it cannot move uh, left or right uh, as well as it cannot move up or down. So now, in this uh, truss, we've got three reactions uh, in there. We want to be able to calculate those reactions. Uh, okay, so we want to be able to calculate or, estimate or uh, work out what the forces are, the direction of the force uh, for those reactions uh, in there. Because then when we're doing that design, this reaction here, we might have to design the support or we might have to design this wall that it sits on top of or the wall on the other side as well. So we need to know what the forces are that are being transferred through the supports so we can um, adequately design connection details and also uh, into the uh, whatever it's been supported on. So in this case, it looks like it's supported on a wall. We need to make sure that that wall is strong enough to carry loads from the trusses uh, in Okay, we also are looking to calculate the magnitude and type of force, whether it's in compression or tension, in each member to design the truss member. So every one of these members, member A to F, member AB, member BC, uh, CF, and so on, we want to be able to know, are they in tension or are they in compression? We also want to know what size the force is within each of those members. So that's what we're trying to do. So how do we determine whether it's statically determinant or not? Uh, well. How many unknowns do we have and how many equations do we have? So let's start with the unknowns. So the unknowns are the number of members and the number of reactions, because we need to know what the unknowns are, the force in each of the members and uh, the reactions. So they're the things that we don't know, so they're the unknowns. So every member we have is an unknown because we don't know the force in each of those members. And every reaction we have is an unknown as well, because we don't know what the magnitude of those uh, reactions are and actually we mightn't even know what the direction of the of those are so in this example here the number of members we have are one two three four five six seven eight nine so we have nine members uh, and we have number of reactions is three reactions so we have nine plus three uh, equals to 12. okay so that's uh we have 12. And in terms of the equations uh so how many equations can we can we generate? So we have we have twelve unknowns, the force in each of those uh, members. So that's nine forces, nine members, and the three reactions. So that's twelve unknowns in total. The equations that we can generate is the number of joints by two, because every joint we have, we can create uh, two equations. So basically, this, uh, looking at this, some of the vertical reactions and looking at the, some of the horizontal reactions. So how many joints have we? Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got six joints in this example. The number of uh, joints is six. Multiply by two is equal to twelve. Okay. So we have uh, so we have two by six, which is effectively uh, equal to, to twelve, and that's equal to m plus r, which is nine 
plus 3, which is effectively equal to 12. So that implies that it's uh, statically uh, determined. So it's, it's statically determined. Uh, truss uh, in there. In other words, we can use hand calculations to work out what all the forces in each of these individual members are. We can work out hand calculations to work out the reactions for that truss. If it turns out that the two times the number of joints was less than the number of members plus the number of reactions, then it's statically indeterminate truss. So, for example, in this case, if if at D we didn't we had a, a pin support rather than a rotor support, what would end up happening is we would have another reaction, a horizontal reaction at D. So that would mean that M plus R would be nine plus four reactions, two here, because of the pin connection, we would end up with two on the right-hand side because it's a pin connection. So that means we would end up with uh, uh, the number of uh, joints as four, and the number of members is equal to nine. Um, Sorry, so the number of, uh, th sorry, we'd have the number of reactions, four, and the number of members equal to nine. That's 13 uh, in there. So that's uh, actually these, these signs are the wrong way around, sorry. So effectively, if the two times the number of joints uh, is, uh, which would be in this case, is 12, if that's, if that's less, if that's, if that's less, and the members, yeah, sorry, that's right. So if two times the number of joints is less than the members in the reaction, so if we put a pin support at D, uh, then we would have, we still have nine members, we'd have eight uh, reactions. Uh, so that's 13. So members plus reactions is 13. That's greater than the number of joints, so therefore statically indeterminate truss. In other words, we can't solve this by hand because there's too many uh, unknowns in it, okay? So the number of unknowns will be 13, uh, and the number of equations we could generate will be 12. So there's more unknowns in the equations, so therefore, a static indeterminate truss. So we can't solve it by hand. Too many unknowns relative to the number of equations. That's fine. We could use um, computer models to, to, uh, to solve that truss, for example. This one would be more of a concern. So if the number of uh, two times number of joints was uh, greater than M plus R, then the truss is unstable. So for example, if I put a roller support uh, at joint A instead of a pin support. So support like what we have at D, we put that at A as well. Then we have no resistance to moving uh, horizontally at A, and then we have only two uh, reactions. We have a vertical reaction at A and a vertical reaction at D. So we would have, uh, we have six joints, so that's 12. Two by six is 12. Uh, we have nine members, and we have two reactions. So that's 12 is greater than uh, 11. So it's truss is unstable. But that's mathematically. It tells it's unstable. But, like it should be pretty obvious when we look at it. If I put a roller here, so I've put a roller skate here on, uh, on on D, put another roller skate underneath um, underneath A. So I have a roller skate on D, a roller skate on A. And then that means if I just give it a little push at all or a little shove, uh, the whole thing will just move over from left to right, okay? Because there's no resistance to stop it from moving left to right. So that's unsta unstable. Basically, the only thing that stops us on a roller skate from uh, keep moving forever is that there's friction between the roller skate and the ground. Uh, in this case, we're assuming that it's frictionless. Uh, so therefore, if I just give it any little uh, nudge at all, the whole thing will just keep going forever over to the right-hand side here. So it's it's unstable. It's not a structure at all. It's a mechanism, actually, if it's uh, uh, if it's unstable. Okay, so mathematically, we can tell if it's unstable, but also intuitively, we should know if it's unstable as well when we look at what uh, at the at the system that we have. Obviously, we can't have that. It's not a structure. Uh, it's un it's unstable, uh, and therefore, it's going to end up uh, failing. Which as a structure engineer, you cannot have, have happen. So what's the joint convention we use? So if we take a node here, so we have a reaction at that node, a member that's in compression, as I, or sorry, that's in uh, tension, as I said, if we look at that member, uh, what we're trying to do to that member is we're trying to stretch the member in tension. So it's got a force in it. We're trying to stretch it. I can get my ruler, trying to stretch it apart. Therefore, what the ruler is trying to do internally is trying to resist that uh, stretching. So if I stretch it by putting externally apply a load and stretch it on the outside the ruler internally is trying to uh, resist that so there's an, it's got an equal and opposite uh, force in it so that's why the arrows are facing in towards the middle of the of the member so that's the notation that we use for tension with the arrows in towards the middle because we're trying to stretch it but the ruler doesn't want to stretch it wants to go back to its original length uh, so therefore arrows go in the way whereas the member in compression is the opposite we're trying to squash it 
the ruler doesn't want to be squashed it doesn't want to be shortened it wants to go back to its original length so the ruler is pushing back on us uh, back out so that therefore the arrows are going out the way when the member is in compression okay so that's the, the that's the uh, sign convention so effectively if we end up with the arrows facing in uh, towards the middle uh, then the member's intention if we get the arrows facing out the way they're in compression Okay, so it's very useful to identify if there's zero uh, fourth members in, 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 a, in a truss because that means we can eliminate those relatively uh, quickly and easily. So when two of the three members meeting at a joint are collinear uh, and no load is acting on the joint, then the fourth and the third member is zero. So for example here, the two members are collinear, so coming into A, it's this member and this member, so in other words they're in the same uh, direction, uh, whereas this third member here comes in perpendicular to it. There's no external uh, force, so it means that the force, whatever is in this force, whatever is in this member has to be equal to the other member opposite, uh, equal to the force in the other member opposite it, and therefore there's no force whatsoever in, in, uh, in the horizontal member. Okay, so these are equal and opposite, uh, whereas this one's equal to zero. Okay, so that, one, that one's kind of easier intuitively to see. Effectively, we see that this member here, the horizontal member, there's nothing. So if I look at the sum of the horizontal reactions, I see that there's a member here, but there's nothing to balance it out on the other side. So therefore, it has to be equal to zero. Whereas if I look at the, some of the vertical reactions, I can see that there's a, a vertical force here. So the vertical force in the other one has to be equal and opposite. This one isn't as intuitive, but it's, it's a similar idea. Again, we have a collinear, two members that are in the same um, direction in there. So therefore, those forces are going to have to be equal and opposite. And the force in the other one is going to have to be uh, equal to zero. When two members meet at a joint where no external load is acting, then the forces in those members are equal to zero. Okay, so here it's two members coming in together. Again, we can see if we do the sum of the horizontal reactions, we have a member here. We have nothing to um, uh, to balance that out. So therefore, we can have no force in that member. We have a vertical member here. With no force to balance it out on the other side. Uh, so therefore, there's no force in either of those members. Same in this one here. Um, same idea. We have a joint here, we have only two members and no force, uh, there's no external load acting on it, so therefore those two are equal to zero. And the same here for the acute angle, we have uh, nothing, no force in the bottom one, therefore we have no force in this top one here. Because if we look at that um, top one, that top one, if we try to put a force in it, let's say if I put a force in that top one, of that, a different colour. Uh, Okay, so if I said, okay, okay, I say oh, there is a force in there, I try and put a force into it, then that force has to be made up of a horizontal component and a vertical component. Okay, so that would be a horizontal component and that would be a vertical component there. So then I would need to get the sum of the horizontal components uh, are equal to zero. But I see uh, I need to have the sum, uh, so that would mean, let's say, that would mean F. Horizontal in A. So F H1, 2. So if that's number 2, there's a number 2, number 1. So that would mean that the I would have to have F H1 uh, has to be equal to F H2. Okay, they have to be equal and opposite to another, so I need to put in a force uh, into uh, this one. So that's equal and opposite, so it's the same magnitude and opposite direction. Okay, so that's FH1. Okay, so that's fine. So they balance out. Uh, then if I look at the um, vertical reactions, some of the vertical reactions also equal, have to equal to zero. So I have uh, FV2, and in this case I have it going down the way, so it's a minus FV2. Well, then I have nothing else in there equals zero okay so nothing else uh, nothing else no other force there in that system i've only got one vertical force that's equal to zero and then if, if fv2 is equal to zero so if fv2 is equal to zero so that component is equal to zero and the other component has to be equal to zero as well because it's you can see the uh, the vector is going at an angle it has to be made up of a, of a horizontal and a vertical component if the vertical component is zero then the horizontal component is equal to zero okay so Therefore, F um, H2 also has to equal to zero. Okay, so everything is equal to zero uh, in that case because it's a vector. Okay, so 
again, trying to keep an eye on these things because it's very useful to, for eliminating um, the um, when we're calculating members to know which ones are, are, have got zero force in it. And so the third, time, third uh, thing when we have uh, to identify zero force members is when two members meet at a joint where there is a support such that the support reaction is collinear with any one member and the force in the other member is equal to zero. So in this case, uh, in this case we have uh, a joint at A. Say we have a vertical reaction at A. And we have no horizontal reaction. Why have we no horizontal reaction? Because A is, is, uh, is on skates, it's on wheels, it can move uh, freely left or right. There's no resistance to moving left or right, uh, so therefore the horizontal reaction is equal to zero. Whereas the vertical reaction, um, there is a vertical reaction, or a potential vertical reaction, because it cannot move up or down. Uh, so then, if I look at the internal members, if that's going up the way, then I have to balance it out with something going down the way. So F vertical in member one, I say member two, so this is number two, number one. Okay, so we have that going down, so it's equal to the opposite. So the sum, the sum of the vertical reaction is equal to zero. That means that RVA has to be equal to FV2. Now we also have to get the sum of the horizontal reactions equal to zero. And we have, so if we put F, um, so FV2 we said is equal to RVA. Then we have X horizontal one. So we have uh, F horizontal one. We have nothing. So if I put a force in there. So F horizontal one um, is equal to what? There's nothing else uh, in there in the whole system. As I said, because A can move left or right. So there's no external uh, reaction there. There's no external resistance. Stop that moving. So therefore, F H V is F for H uh, one is as equal to zero. Okay, so we can just do it mathematically. And intuitively, we could we should know that the member um, is free to move left or right. Therefore, there's no resistance, no external resistance to stop that A from moving to left or moving to the right. And therefore, um, the, the horizontal member in here can't have any force in it because you have the collinear between this uh, internal member and the reaction is okay so when there's two members coming together and one of those members is collinear with the with a, with a reaction uh, then the force in the other one is equal to zero okay so if joints uh, if a joint is only two non-collinear members and there's no external load or support reaction that joint then those two members are zero force members okay so like in this example here um we have de uh, and uh, DC in there, and we have AF and uh, AB. Okay, so we can see that there's nothing external here. So again, if we look at A, the sum of the vertical reactions is a force, or some of the vertical forces are equal to zero. The for there could be a force in FA, but there's nothing to balance it out. Therefore, there can be no force in FA. Same thing in the horizontal direction. If we had a force in uh, AB, we need something to be equal and opposite on the other side. We don't have anything on the other side, so therefore it's equal to zero. And that's the same up here uh, with these guys up here at the top. So this whole uh, truss here, we've actually, uh, FA has no force in it, AB has no force in it, ED is no force in it, and DC is no force in it. So the force uh, P uh, heads in through uh, CEF in, uh, in tension and uh, CBF in, in compression. So you can easily provide um, these results by applying the uh, equations of the equilibrium of joints uh, D and A. So, as I, I just explained there, zero force members can thus be disregarded for the simple uh, cross analysis. As I said, uh, ED, DC, FA, and, and AC. We don't need those in the truss analysis because we know that they don't have any forces within them. Three members form a truss joint where two of the members are collinear. So we have three members and two of them are collinear. There's two uh, that are collinear. Here's another two that are collinear in there. And there's no external load, so no load here or no load there. At the joint, the, the third non collinear member has zero forces in it. So in this case, that's um, AD and um, AC don't have any, any loads in them. Okay, again, so we can simplify that truss uh, for the analysis. 
to be able to do the do the design. Oh, zero force members are used to increase stability and rigidity of a, of a truss. Okay, so it's not that we don't need them, but it, it um, can help with increasing the stability and rigidity of the of the truss. Okay, so what I'm going to do is going to do a quick uh, example. So looking at uh, exam paper from two years ago, the um, question one of that exam paper. This is what what it would ask you to do. Probably won't go through all of this now. I'll, I'll, I'll finish off the other bits again. Um, the truss uh, here in this figure one. So the truss in figure one here is to be designed to support a roof. So this is a, sim a similar type of truss that you might be using. Um, so it's used to design. Uh, the, is to be designed to support a roof that's only accessible for repair and maintenance. Okay. So on top of this roof here, we would have some purlins that would go into the page. Uh, and then we have some covering on that roof in there to keep out the rain, the wind, uh, and the cold, and so on. Um, so there's nothing allowed to go up on that roof, only for access on it. Okay, so therefore that's the only uh, load that we would need to design for for access to the top of it. Um, the truss is a 14 meter span with a 15 degree pitch. So we can see the pitch here is 15 degrees. So the pitch being the angle between the bottom cord and the top cord, that's 15 degrees. And then the span between A and H is 14 meters. So we can see three and a half meters. Uh, so all of these dimensions are in millimeters. Uh, four uh, three and a half are equal to 14 uh, meters. The truss uses hollow sections for its tension cord. So we know that the tension cord is going to be in the bottom uh, in there because it's going to want to bend down the way. So the bottom um, is going to be in tension. The top is going to be in compression. So we know that the uh, we've been told that hollow sections, using hollow sections for the bottom one, um, and the rafters or the top cord, we're going to use hollow sections and for the internal member. So it's actually made up of all hollow sections the whole lot. The truss is fully welded, so we're going to weld um, the, the sections together so we don't have to worry about um, bolted connections. The truss analysis has been carried out by placing concentrated loads at the joints of the truss. So here are the concentrated loads, F and D. At each of the different uh, nodes. Okay, so we have an FD, a B, D, and G. And like in your project, you'll end up with half of the load at the last one. Okay, because if I take, so if I take uh, the roof, say half, half of the load from the roof. Okay, so that's uh, half of the load from either side. So that would go in here. FD, whereas if I look at the amount of uh, loading that's available for uh, A, only half the amount of roof there um, for A, so that's why I have FD over 2 uh, in there. Same on the other side, it's symmetrical as well, by the way, so we can keep an eye on symmetrical um, because that means that we only have to design half of it because then the other half is going to be the exact same if it's symmetrical. Okay. So we can see here, this is effectively um, uh, the loading. For FT, yeah. So any load that's on the roof, um, in that width there, and whatever depth it is into the page, that goes into, that gives us the point load FD in there. Whereas at the very end here, we have half of that uh, loading width, so it's half of FD over two. Okay, so the truss is fully welded. Okay, the truss now is carried out by placing concentrated loads at the joints of the truss. We've done that. All of the joints are assumed to be pinned in the analysis. Okay, so there's a pin connection at every uh, at every node. Usually what we uh, indicate pinned connections uh, by are an open circle. Let's say that they're pinned. Okay, so every joint has got a pin connection. That means that there's no moment transferred across the connection. So therefore only axial uh, force are carried by the members. The design value for the ultimate limit state of the, uh, of the forces uh, FD is 43.9 kilonewtons. Okay, so we looked at what the uh, roof loading is. It's been carried by this width here. Looked at the dead load, which is the weight of, I'd say, the purlins that are sitting on top of this, the, the weight of the uh, roof covering that's on it, 
and so on. And say the self weight of the trust itself, that's the dead load. We also looked at the imposed load, which is due to the people going up there for maintenance. And then we would have factored up the dead load by 1.35, the live load or the imposed load by 1.5. And whenever that load is in per, per square meter, we would then get that into a, um, into a load of kilonewtons of FD. So somebody has done that already for us. We've got 43.9 kilonewtons as the load onto FD. The truss is simply supported at A uh, with a roll, uh, and a roller support at H. So I'll draw that in graphically. So it's, we said it's a, at A, it's a pin support, and at H, it's a uh, roller support. Okay, so H can freely move left to right, uh, but it cannot move up or down. Whereas A cannot move left to right or it cannot move up or down. Okay, so what we're asked to do is determine the reaction at A, and you get one mark from that. So one mark to work out what the reaction at A is. Uh, determine the design force of members A, B, and A, C. That's A, B, and A, C. There's just two marks for that. Um, so only three marks for, 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 for doing your trust analysis. Checks the stability of member 100 by 100 by 5 SHS section for member AB. So this is AB. In other words, that member is going to be in compression. Uh, we want to work out what it's, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's adequate size. In other words, the force, when we work out what the force is in AB, which we're going to do from part B, we want to check to see, that's the demand on AB, we want to check to see the capacity of the member 100 by 100 by 5 SHS uh, of grade S, uh, 355 is larger than that demand. You also have to determine a suitable square hollow section. Uh, so a square hollow section is an SHX, S, um, a grade S35 to use for member AC. So that's an AC, so that member is going to be in tension. So we want to find a member to use in, in tension. What does a square hollow section look like? Well, it's going to be like this. So it's, it's, a, it's a square and it's hollow. Okay, so in this case, we have it's 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. And the thickness of the wall. Okay, so that's your 100 by 100 by 10 square hollow section. Okay, so it's a hollow section where it has got a steel is made up of uh, eight, it's 10 millimeters thick. And it's 100 mil by 100 mil in terms of its overall dimension. So B is 100 mil and H is equal to 100 mil. Okay, so that's the, that's the question. So you can see how quickly you're going to have to be able to design um, trust members if only three out of the 20 marks are actually to be able to work out forces uh, and the other um, 17 are to work out the resistance of two members, the resistance and compression. And the resistance um, in in tension. Okay, so let's uh, let's have a go at this. Oh. Um. Okay, so we said that uh, we said A is a pin support. We said H is a roller support. We said that the force F D uh, was equal to forty three point nine. So our first, our first question was our first part of the question was uh, determine the reaction okay so <clears throat> What reactions might we have? So if we look at uh, A, so A cannot move left or right, or it cannot move up or down. So therefore, it could have a, a, a vertical reaction at A, and also it can have a horizontal reaction at A. Now, it doesn't matter which way I draw these uh, to start off with, because if I draw them the wrong way, I would get a negative answer for them back out. So I, just, I usually draw my reactions in the vertical direction, I suppose most times they are. Gravity is pushing down, so the reaction is pushing back up. Um, and the horizontal reaction, uh, I often just draw it from left to right. So because usually a positive is in the is going from left to right. Uh, and then what else might I have? Well, at, at at H, I have a reaction at H. Vert oh. 
vertical vertical reaction at h okay and i've no horizontal reaction at h because that can freely move left or right there's no resistance no nothing to stop it from moving left to right so i don't have a reaction there so how might i calculate this well i've got a few uh tricks up my sleeve i can uh look at equilibrium so i'm going to look at equilibrium of external applied forces okay so what qu equations I have i have three equations I have the sum of the horizontal reactions is equal to zero I have the sum of the vertical sum of the vertical reactions are equal to zero and i've got the sum of the moments are also equal to zero okay so if i draw so x and y Okay, so I know that some of the moments are equal to zero because, for example, if I'm standing on point uh, H here, I've just told you that H is a is a pin connection. I told you it's a pin connection. I told you it can freely move left or right. I told you it can't move up or down. But it can freely rotate. So if it can freely rotate, we know there's no moment at H. It's the same way over at A. I know that uh, at A, there's no moment at A either because... Um, I said that it can freely rotate at A as well. And then actually at all of the other nodes as well, uh, there's no there's no moment at any node because we've made them pin connections everywhere. Okay. So if I take the sum of the horizontal reactions are equal to zero, and what have I got here? I've got uh, R H A equals have i any other horizontal force there so i have all these fds going down the way they're vertical i have nothing else in there so that means that the reaction at a is equal to zero now that doesn't mean that i can make this as a as a roller support uh, in there because uh, if i do that then it's going to be indeterminate or it's going to be a, a unstable in other words because it's roller here roller there a little puff of wind and a little movement and it'll just keep going forever and ever if i try and move left to right there's no forces in it there's no reaction at a at the moment because there's no external horizontal load so if we could keep that in there there's no horizontal load however if we do put any horizontal load like a little shove over here from the edge onto it then there's going to be a reaction there so at the moment there's no reaction so it's equal to zero but as i said that doesn't mean that we could make this a roller connection because if we made it a roller connection it'd be unstable and the whole thing could just uh, would just head off uh, forever and ever without stopping okay so the sum of the vertical reactions are equal to zero. So what have I got? Well, if I look at what's going up the way first, I have R V A is up there from the reaction at A. I've also a reaction at uh, H R V H. Okay. And then what else have I got? I've got uh, other ones going down the way. So they're minus. I have uh, minus F D over two. Uh, I have minus F D. I have another minus F D. Another minus FD and another minus FD over two, okay, and that's equal to zero. Okay, so that tells me well, I have two unknowns. I keep all the unknowns to the left hand side. It's uh, RVA plus RVH, the reaction at A and the reaction at V. I don't know those, and I know what the FDs are because they're forty three point nine two. I was given those, and I've got one, two, three. I've got four of those, so I've got four uh, FDs. Okay, so I bring all those to the right hand side. Once I obviously cross over um, from one side of the um, equation to the other, so I'm bringing one, two, three, and two halves is four. Bring in four of those FDs, moving them all over the other side of the um, of the equals sign. So as I move anything across the equal sign, I'm going to change its uh, its um, sign. So there were four minus four FD. I bring it to the other side. It's going to be four uh, uh, FD. Okay, so RA. Uh, plus R RVH equals 4FD. Now, that's not a lot of good to me because at the moment, because what is, what is it? I've got two unknowns, the two reactions, two vertical reactions uh, in there, and I've only got one equation. So that's no good to me. So I need, uh, I need another equation uh, in there. So I know that the sum of the moments are equal to zero. So if I take the moments about H, uh, and if I take them about H, say, uh, being in the um, clockwise direction as being positive. So if I'm standing on H, so here I am standing over here at H, I say, oh, I'm happy out standing here on H. There's no moment, I feel no moment whatsoever. So on my right hand side here, there's no moment. 
So when I look over to the left, it means all of these forces, any force times distance gives me moment. So there is this force here, FD over two, is going straight through where I'm standing, so it's not applying any moment because it's, uh, it's lever arm is zero. As I said, the moments to the right are equal to zero. So when I go to all of the, uh, to the left, I've got a force here, FD, that's acting at a distance away of uh, three and a half meters. I've got another force here, FD, that's acting at seven meters away. Another force here, FD, is acting at uh, seven, ten and a half meters away. And then I have another force over here, FD over two, that's acting 40 meters away. And I have another force here, RVA, that's acting 14 meters away. So they're all the forces that I have, I have to deal with. So we have the first force, uh, FD. And uh, we said that that's three and a half meters away. We have the second force, uh, FD. We said that that's acting seven meters away, so that's the one up at the uh, apex of, of the truss there. We have the third force, uh, FD. Uh, and that's, uh, that's equal to ten and a half meters away. Now we have the fourth one, which is FD over two. It's acting 14 meters away. And sorry, they're all acting in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so they're all acting in the counterclockwise direction because I see this one here is going through that way. Okay, so that's the lever arm. Do it, so it's three and a half meters away. So that's three and a half meters. Uh, there's the distance times FD. So they're all counterclockwise. Uh, in there, so actually, they should all be really minuses. I'm going to put those minuses just to stay consistent. So they're minus, 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 and minus. Okay, so they're all minuses because they're all in the counterclockwise direction. Oh no. No. Okay, so they're on the minus direction. Uh, and then I have uh, RVA is going up the way, so that's in, the, in the, the other direction. So plus RVA, and that's 14 meters away. Okay, so the sum of all those is equal to zero. As I said, because I know that when I uh, look here to the right hand side, there's no, no moment, it has to be zero here, no moment there. So when I look at everything, the sum of all the moments, so I have all the external forces, FD times his lever arm, next FD times his lever arm, next FD times his lever arm, FD over two times his lever arm. They're all going down the way counterclockwise that way. Whereas RA is going up the way, it's going clockwise. It's at a distance of 14 meters away, so that's a plus uh, value. So I'll work that out, so then that's going to be uh, RVA. So I'll bring that to the one side, uh, equals. Of all these FDs, so I'll just take FD outside because I've again crossed over the equilibrium line, I cross over the, the, the equals line, bringing all the FDs to the right hand side. So they're going to change a uh, sign, so they're all minuses, so they're going to change sign. So FD into 3.5 plus 7 plus 10.5 plus uh, 14 over 2, which is uh, another 7. Okay, because I've got 14 divided by 2 is 7. And then I had 14 times the RA, so I'm going to divide all that by 14. Okay, so when I work that out, um, I'm going to get, I think it's 2.0 times FD. So that's 2 times an FD. That we've given that in the question is uh, 43.92 kilonewtons. So that's 87.84 kilonewtons. Okay, so I've got the reaction at R, R, uh, HA um, is the reaction at A. And then if I want to, so I've got equation. So I've got equation, equation, oh. So I've got equation one which is RH, A is equal to zero. I've got equation two, which tells me that our, uh, that the vertical reaction at A and the vertical reaction at H is four times FD. 
And now I've got equation three down here, uh, which is, tells me what the vertical reaction is at, at A. So I can, uh, I can substitute three into two. So that one tells me that RVA, so RVA then I've got is, is 87.84 uh, plus RVH equals four and FD, and FD is 43.92. Okay, so that implies RVH is equal to, so I have, uh, that's equal to, so four of them, and I had two of them, so that means it's two, so it's equal to 87.84. Okay, so I've now been able to work out um, RVA and RVB, or RVH, sorry, so that I've got the reaction at at A, which is what I've been asked to calculate, but then just for completeness, I've also worked out what the reaction is at um, H, the vertical reaction. And this should be um, should be the same, because it's symmetrical. If I look through here, it's a symmetrical section. It's symmetrical in terms of loading, symmetrical in terms of its geometry. So whatever the reaction is at A, it should be at H. Well, we've proven that mathematically. They both equal the same thing. So in that um, exam paper from 2018-19, you would have got one mark for working out working out that uh, in it, one out of 20 marks for working out that. Okay, so next thing we have to work out is we have to work out what, uh, so part B. So part B. Part B of this uh, is determine the design force. In members A, B, and A, C. Okay, so we've worked out that we have a reaction, a uh, vertical reaction here at A, uh, which we just worked out to be 87.84. We know that the force is at FD um, are equal to 43.92. And we know then FD over 2 is obviously half of that. Okay, so half, FD over 2 is half of that, is 21.96, is it, Canadians? Okay. So we want to work out what the design force is there in, in numbers AB and AC. So what we said is, we said, well, we start off, they're unknown, so we're going to assume that they're um, in tension. We assume everything's in tension, even though intuitively you should know which is in tension, which is a compression, but we're going to say that they're all in tension. So if they're in tension, we're going to put the uh, arrows facing in the way. Okay, so that's, um, that's the force in AC, and the force in... Okay, so we're going to have the opposite force in uh, AB. Okay, so we've got, uh, so we've now got that joint. So we're going to look at equilibrium at the joint. So we're going to look at equilibrium at joint A. Okay, so here we, what we assumed up here, assumed that members in tension. Okay, so remember we said we'd assume the members are in tension. So we assume the members are in tension and then we said if they're if we have them the wrong way, we get a negative answer for them and then we'd put them the other way and tell us they're in compression. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at equilibrium at joint A. So we take joint A out. So we have A we have a vertical reaction here. OK, 
Okay, we've got a uh, vertical reaction today. We've got this member here, FAC, that we don't know what it is yet. Um, and we've got this other member here, FAB. Again, we don't know what it is yet. We've got a um, another horizontal or another vertical member here, which is F D over two. Okay, and R A is actually was in two F D, which equals to twenty seven point eight four. Okay, or eighty seven sorry And the angle between those two is fifteen degrees. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to look at uh, equilibrium at point A. So we look at say, the sum. So again, same as last time, x horizontal direction, y is the other direction. So the sum of the horizontal forces are equal to zero. So I have uh, FAC. Going to the right, so it's positive because it's in the x direction. Uh, going to the right, and then what else have I got in that in that diagram there? I've got FAB as well. Uh, so I have FAB that I need to uh, work out. So FAB uh, should have a vertical and a horizontal component. Okay, so FAB. So FAB is going off up here. So I'm going to change that vector into horizontal and the vertical component. So it's 15 degrees. So I know that the so I know that the cos of 15 degrees is equal to the adjacent. So I can draw that one if the horizontal part of AB and the vertical part of AB. Okay, so I know that um uh, cos is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse okay, from my basic tri trigonometry, so the horizontal over hypotenuse. I know that the sine of an angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Okay, so I know that those two from basic trigonometry. So I want to work out what FHB is. And cos, so that implies f the horizontal part because I want to work out the horizontal component is equal to the FAB. So I'm just taking the FAB from below the line, multiply that by the cos of 15 degrees. Okay, so I'm going to put that into my equation. So I have the uh, FAC and the one going across the bottom, and then the horizontal component of FB, which is equal to the horizontal component of FB, is equal to the um, sorry, the horizontal component of uh, AB, which is the hypotenuse, which is FAB, times the cos of uh, 15 degrees. And then that's all I have. I don't have any other, um, I don't have any other forces, so that's equal to zero. Okay. So that's one equation I have. But I still have two unknowns. I still don't know what FAC is, and I still don't know what FAB is. So I'll go to my other equation. Some of the uh, so that's the first equation. So I'll just put a, a one behind that. That's the first equation. So the second equation. Some of the vertical reactions are equal to zero. So what have I got? So everything going up the way is positive. So I've got R V. A, and up the way, I have minus FD over 2 going down the way at the joint. The FAC, uh, so the member AC on the bottom only has a horizontal component, it doesn't have a vertical component. But FAB, this one here has a horizontal and a vertical component. Yeah, So we drew it out here, FAB, it has a horizontal component and a vertical component. We know the vertical component is equal to the, the hypotenuse times the sine of 15 degrees. So we put that in there. So it's going, uh, and we have a facing up the way. Therefore, we're going to give it a positive one because it's, oh, we have everything in the going up the way as being positive. So plus FAB sine of 15 degrees 
which is effectively the vertical component of uh, vector AB. Okay. Um, and so the only thing that we don't know there is FAB, because we know what RVA is, we know what FD is. So we have F uh, AB is equal to RVA, so it's equal to minus, because I'm bringing it over to the other side of the line, uh, minus all of that stuff, um, divided by sine of 15 degrees. So that's minus RVA, 87.84, then a minus by a minus gives me a plus. FD over uh, 2, we said it's 21.96, all divided by the sine of 15 degrees. We work that out. Hopefully we work that out, we get... Um, Minus two hundred and fifty four point five Canadians. Okay. So it's uh, it's negative implies wrong direction of force assumed. Okay. So it's negative, so it's wrong direction. So you'd assume there's intention, but actually it's in compression, which is what we would expect. Okay, so therefore FAB is equal to uh, minus 254.5 kilonewtons, uh, which is in compression, okay? Because if it's minus, it's in compression because we've assumed uh, that. Positive intention. Okay, that's the equation. That's uh, that's two, and then substitute two into one. Okay, so what is one? What is two into one? Uh, one we have FAC plus FAB times the cost of fifteen degrees. So that's FAC plus FAC plus FAB in terms of cost of 15 degrees. Okay, so that means FAB is the one that we want to know. Force in, uh, in FAB. Sorry, FAB. Sorry, force FAC is what we want to know. So FAC uh, is equal to minus. FAB, so we've worked out FAB, so it's uh, minus, we need the same, minus 254.5 times the cost 15 degrees. So FAC then, that works out then to be 245.9 kilonewtons, and it's positive. Uh, so therefore, uh, we're right, that it's the right direction, so our assumption was correct, therefore it's intention. Okay, so we've designed uh, FAC. So effectively, we said, we assumed that the that FAC was intention, we're correct. That's going to be FAC equals 245.9 kilonewtons intention. Whereas the other one was in compression. So the arrows are going out the way. FAB uh, is equal to 254.5 kilonewtons. And that's in compression. Okay, so we've got a we've got a, a tension member, we've got a compression member in there. Okay. So that's a compression member and a tension member, okay?
So now we have the forces in those members and then we can design the members. So effectively what we, go, what we would do now uh, is, uh, and like what we've been asked to do in the question, I'm not going to go through it all here, we can do this uh, another time, uh, is that we have a member at the bottom uh, is intention. So therefore, we know the force, 245.9 uh, kilonewtons, that's the demand. We can then find a member that's large enough to withstand that uh, demand. In this case, we're going to find a, a square hollow section. It's going to be large enough uh, to have a capacity in tension that's higher than 245.9. We're also going to find a member that's going to span from A to B. We know that the, it's going to be uh, in compression, so it's going to be squashed along its length, uh, and it's going to have a load in there as 254. 4.5 kilonewtons in compression. We want to check to see if the member that we've been given in the question, uh, 100 by 100 by uh, 5 SHS, so 100 high, 100 wide, and 5 millimeter thick wall. We want to see if that section is of good enough capacity to withstand this compression load. So we, that's back to uh, the examples that we had done previously uh, at the at the start in the in the in the, in the earlier assignments that we had to do. So you should be able to design those and I would recommend that you go and try and uh, finish off that question yourself by designing the compression member and designing the tension member. And if you have any questions on it then come back to me uh, on that. Okay so that's the um, that's the example uh, done. So what you're going to do now, we're going to put you off into your uh, group so we'll see if anyone has any questions, but what we're going to do now is you're going to design a roof structure. Uh, we're going to have uh, we need to work out um, some loads on it. We need to work out wind loading. We're not going to. We're going to simplify wind loading in our in our problem uh, here because it's a complicated load type. Uh, and then we're going to do load combinations. So we'll have to cover that now in, in a second. But effectively, this is what you have to do in your project. It's uh, you have a, a roof system that's made up of fink trusses. So this is a plan view here. So this is the roof plan. Uh, we have a fink truss. Uh, so we have all these fink trusses uh, in the say in the, uh, along grid line one, two, and so on. So those are the fink trusses in there. Each of them are spanning 10 meters. So it's a 10 meter span. If we look down on the elevation at the bottom, it's a 10 meter span, it's got two meters high, and it's got all of these individual um, elements uh, in it. Okay, so we're gonna have to um, work out what the force is in or all those individual elements. Uh, then you also have um, the Pratt truss, which runs the other direction. Okay, so the Pratt truss runs the other direction. Here they are here, running the other direction. It's about on 13 meters. So you can see the Fink truss sits on top. So this is the Fink truss. It then comes in and sits on top of the Pratt, the Pratt truss uh, in there. I don't know if I can draw this in 3D. Try. So not much space. Um, so if I have a Fink truss coming like this. Uh, these are all the Fink trusses. And they sit on top of the Pratt trusses. Yes, the Pratt trusses run in the other direction. Like that. Um, okay, so every time there's a fink truss, um, the fink truss is in the other color. There's a fink truss coming in. There's another one coming in. There's one in here. Another one in here, and so on. Okay, so you see the fink truss comes in, they sit on top of the Pratt truss, and then there'll be another Pratt truss outside here. Okay. So on, okay. Okay, so that's the... Um, that's what you're going to have to design as part of the project. Right, one second. Okay. 